Brother Mike's sermon text will be in Ephesians 3, 2 through 6. Assuming that you have heard this of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, Revelation has written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight to the sons of men in other generations, as has no between revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are following here as members of the same body and partakers of the promise in of Jesus through the gospel. The Heavenly Father, I pray that Brother Mike's words would be edifying, and I pray that um, our ears would be open to our Jesus' name. Amen. That's people. Because it is a message of glad tidings, and it's full of good things. We're talking about good things from a good God. And what he makes known, he doesn't want you just to know about them. He wants you to be a partaker of them. That you would be a partaker of his promise in Christ Jesus by the gospel. As, as, the, as the apostle loads upon the saints at Ephesus, these good things of God, the preeminent thing that he wants you to know that all these things are found in Christ Jesus and nowhere else. They're in Christ. And so he begins to make this ministration known to make glad the hearts of the people of God. Things like you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. <clears throat> you have been chosen in him before the foundations of the world. You have been adopted of children by Jesus Christ. You are accepted of God in the beloved. In Christ, you have redemption through his blood. You have the forgiveness of, his sin, of sins. In Christ, he hath abounded unto you in all wisdom and prudence. And in him also you have obtained an inheritance. Now this, this good news is proclaimed. It's proclaimed here specifically to the saints at Ephesus, but not only to the saints at Ephesus. In the first verse it says, and also to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So this, this, this obtainment, this Partakement is not only for the saints at Ephesus in that, in that generation, but it's for all saints of all times and all generations that are in Christ Jesus. And now as he, as he, as he continues through the, the, the epistle, he comes to this point in chapter 3, and it's full of good news. It's full of good news. Particularly, he's ministering that the Gentiles, those people, those nations, that are not of the lineage of the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, the Jews, they're included in this promise. And you got to remember, it's to the Jews that pertain this adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. This pertains to the Jews. But the good news is sounded out now it's not to the Jews only. The Gentiles are now partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus by the gospel. See, in our generation, the acceptance of the Gentiles by God is not something that is very much looked upon as a mighty accomplishment of God. It is almost never even considered or spoken about in the assemblies today. However, the gospel does not take this position at all. The Gentiles being accepted by the God of Israel is a mighty working and accomplishment of God. And it came at a great cost to God 
and to his beloved son. Amen. As a matter of the record here, what Paul is revealing to the Ephesian assembly, which is mostly a Gentile assembly, is that this purpose of God was not something new, something that had been determined before the foundation of the world. But, he says, in other ages it was not made known unto the sons of men. See, there's something more that the scripture is revealing, and it is good news. We want to see it right here. There's more here. He's saying that not all the ages of time are the same. There are other ages, other ages. There was a time before the flood, and there was a time after the flood. There was an age before the giving of the law, and there was an age after the giving of the law. The good news here is we're not in those ages anymore. The saints are not in those other ages. There's a now that the, that the apostle brings forth. Now, there's something now, and it's different than what happened in those other ages. Now, if you want to know what distinguishes one age from another age, you're not going to find that out by consulting the history books of men. What man's history uses to d distinguish one age from another is on the basis of what men have done. What distinguishes the ages that the Apostle Paul is speaking are, are what differences the workings of God are being done. Amen. What God has done, what God is doing, what God has accomplished. Amen. And specifically now, he's speaking about this other age, another age, this, this now is based on the things that his son, Jesus, has accomplished. That's what distinguishes the now from the other ages. They're, 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 they are being made known. See, things are being made known now that weren't made known in other ages. See, together, all these other ages are those which extended from the creation unto the appearing of the Lord Jesus from heaven. Some 4,000 years of time, there were things not made known by God unto the sons of men. Things that pertain to God things that concerning his eternal purpose, things that pertain to life and godliness towards him, and the things that God had promised to give unto his people, and these are all good things. These are, from the, from the words of the scripture, these are secret things. These are the secret things of God. The, and the secret things of God, they belong to the Lord our God. But that's not the end of the revelation of God. There's a but in here. He says, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, forever. And that's what the apostle Paul is saying. We're, we're not in that age of where things are not made known to the sons of God, sons of men. He is making things known to the sons of men. And he says, these things are now revealed to the apostles and prophets. So if you want to know about those things, you got to go to his apostles. You got to go to the prophets. There's no other way these things are going to be made known. He has revealed them to his holy apostles and prophets. And they were faithful to make known these things that were given to them by God. So we encourage one another through the words of the apostles. Brethren, we're not in those ages. We're not in those other ages. And these other ages are declared ended with the advent of God's beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, coming into the world. It was through his accomplishing work that the ages when these secrets or mysteries were not made known unto the sons of men, they're over. Now, God is making known these things concerning himself and his Christ and God's eternal purpose in him, in him. And he's doing so by the gospel. And there's a reason, there's a reason for this. It's because light has come into the world. And Jesus is that light. Jesus is the light of the world. When Jesus speaks and he continues to speak from heaven, 
even unto this day through the gospel, when men hear his words and believe them now, by the commandment of Almighty God, light shines into their hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See, with this proclamation of the gospel by our Lord Jesus Christ himself in the days of his flesh, that which the prophets said would happen, Jesus is announcing they are happening. The prophet said this, the, of the ones who would hear the gospel and believe it, they were now going to partake of those things that the prophet said would come to pass. Jesus, this is spoken about in, in the, uh, the work of the Son of God upon the earth. It says, they that sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the, re sat in the region in the shadow of death, death, light is sprung up. And this is only the beginning of the things of the saints' partakement of these secret things that belong unto the Lord. And the announcement of the gospel is the saints do now partake of them in Christ Jesus. The, mess, the good news is to each and every one, both then and, and now unto this very day, be they Jew or Gentile, if they be male or female, bond or free, if they have been enlightened in the knowledge of God, it is because Jesus has done it. If any have heard the gospel and been taught by it, they, they have heard Christ and they have been taught by Christ as the truth is in Jesus. Through the proclamation of the gospel being mixed with faith, Jesus effectually removes the darkness concerning the knowledge of God. Jesus effectually removes error. He removes ignorance and false teaching and the traditions of men concerning the things of God. See, the main difference between the other ages and the now, the other ages when the things were not made known unto the sons of men and now, is the light of the glorious gospel is shining in us. And it's, G it's because of Jesus. He is the main difference why things are now known as opposed to the ages when they were not known. For Jesus is the true light, which lighteth every man which cometh into the world. Apostle Paul is also showing us this matter of God's working in his kingdom. He's affecting and accomplishing and fulfilling all this through a message. It is Almighty God himself who has determined, purposed, empowered, and provided this message. It is the record that God has given of his son. God has given this record of his son. And that record is a powerful worker. The gospel is glorious. It is illuminating, it is enlivening, it is life-changing, it is empowering unto all that receive it and believe it. Amen. The gospel is full of divine power that produces good things in all that hear it, believe it, and keep it. And that power never fades nor weakens. See, at its very core, the gospel is a declaration of divine accomplishment revealed to people who need to hear good news. For since the days of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, men, and I'm talking about all men, need to hear good news. But it would be a very long time before man would be enabled not only to hear it, but also to understand it and to believe it and to be partakers of it. Amen. Yet, this is the very thing that God desired for all men, even from the very beginning. Amen. In truth, all men need to hear that a provision has been made by God to raise them who are dead in trespasses and sins. They need to hear this. And the gospel announces that that provision is Christ Jesus himself. For Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. All men need to know 
that God has made a provision for them to be delivered from an adversary whose death hold on them was mightier than they, both individually and collectively. And the gospel declares this is precisely what Jesus has accomplished by his death, destroying him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And all men need to know that God has made a provision to bring them up from the horrible pit of sin and death, out of the miry clay that holds them fast, in which they sink further and further down into it every day. And yet, even bringing out of the pit wasn't enough. They had to be not only brought out of this horrible pit, they needed to be set on a solid rock in which no sinking occurs, where, that's, where solid and steadfast things are, and have their way established in this life and also in the one to come. The gospel makes known that Jesus Christ himself is that provision. And all men need to know that God has purposed an eternal purpose, and it's in Christ Jesus. And that he is able to perform unto fullness and completion all that he said he would do. And again, the gospel reveals that it is Christ Jesus himself who has been glorified and exalted to the right hand of the majesty in the heavens who has been given all power and authority by God himself in heaven and in earth to bring all these things to pass. See, the preeminent good news of the gospel is Jesus Christ himself. It is declared to be, he is declared to be all that is spoken of him. It, it is revealed that all that he has accomplished has been received by God. And all that he is doing now and engaging in is pleasing unto God. He is always about doing those things that please the Father, and bringing many sons to glory is pleasing unto the Father. Amen. And so by his life, he is able to save to the uttermost them who come unto him by faith. He's saving us by his life now at the right hand of God. See, from its very beginning of the record God has given of his son, to its glorious conclusion, Jesus is the good news of the gospel. Now to all that receive and continue to believe, this is something I want to stress as we continue on here, those who received and are partakers of, the, of, of his promise need to continue in it. These things that he has made known about his Christ, his work, these ones are the ones that are empowered to be partakers of his promise, of God's promise. We're talking about partakers of God's promise. And this is the promise which he's promised us, even eternal life. Now there are many exceeding and great and precious promises that are recorded in the word of God for us. And of them all, this is the sum, eternal life. And all those in Christ are partakers of that eternal life even now. The gospel declares that all those in Christ Jesus are not spectators to the promises of God, but rather they are partakers of his promise. See, there's a major difference between just knowing these things and partaking of them. The gospel empowers these ones to be partakers of his promise, and it's in Christ Jesus. See, the saints now are not merely comers who come and see things. We are partakers of his promise in Christ. And that eternal life of whom it is revealed is Christ himself. Christ Jesus is that eternal life. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Lord from heaven, who opens wide this most glorious truth. In the days of his flesh, he said this, whosoever believeth in me, whosoever. Jesus used that term often in his ministry. Whosoever. You wanna be able to see yourself in that large group of whosoever believe his word when he says it, whosoever. 
whosoever believeth in me. The word of Christ speaks of continuance, not a one-time event. Who believeth currently, has believed, continues to believe. Whosoever believeth in me, he says, will should not perish. Should not perish. Now, it's not an iffy word. When Jesus spoke it, it's a word of power. It's a word that means you will not perish. You cannot perish if you continue to believe in him. Whosoever, whosoever believeth in me, Jesus said, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever, whosoever believeth in Christ, is the most wonderful revelation and declaration by the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus, the King, spoke and utilized this wonderful word, whosoever, many times in his ministration to people to make known the reality of it. For it reveals the completeness and the oneness of his work. And it pertains to both Jew and Gentile. Each and every one, with no exception, that believes in Christ has eternal life. Be it Jew, be it Gentile, male, female, bond or free, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Man's distinctions cannot override what Jesus has made known. And there is no power or authority which can overrule that which the only potentate has decreed. Because yes. his words come with divine power. Amen. He comes with all the divine power of Almighty God himself. All those that continue to believe in Jesus have. They possess and they are partakers of that eternal life. Even right now is the declaration of him that sitteth at the right hand of the power of God. Amen. Paul makes known that in other ages this was not the case. There were comers <clears throat> who came to the tabernacle of God, but they could not partake of those good things of God that were in the tabernacle. The best they could do was bring their offerings unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and put it into the hands of the priest. The comers could go no further than that. See, the comers were not partakers in other ages. In other ages, they could not partake of those good things of God hidden under the badger skins and the ram skins dyed red. They could only come and look. They could not partake of the illumination that prevailed under the coverings. They could not feast on the sustenance provided in the holy place. And they could not partake of the benefit of that sweet fragrance that filled the holy place. But the good news of the gospel says that Christ has broken down all these walls of partitions. He's broken down all the barriers, all those things that prevented the comers from being partakers. Amen. See, now, now, the now, the comers are partakers. They partake of the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're affected by it. The comers partake of the nourishment of the good word of God and they're fed and they're strengthened and they're increased. Amen. And the comers partake of that fragrance that permeates the holy place. Amen. Amen. It now permeates them. That sweet smelling fragrance is vital to anyone that would come into the most holy place where God himself does dwell its effect upon the partakers whose very persons would hold that smell was like the shadow of Jacob coming unto his father Isaac for a blessing. If you remember that count, a count as, as Jacob came near, there was something he put on. He put on in order that he might be received of his father and recognized by his father. And when he put that on, he approached Jacob and Jacob, he, he approached Isaac and Isaac said, see the smell of my son. He smelt the smell of his son and he blessed him. 
See, this is, this is, this is a shadow of what we, are, what we partake of in Christ Jesus. We put on Christ. We are partakers of Christ. And we come unto the Father and he says, I smell the smell of my son. And he says, I'll bless you for it. Amen. The blessings are now given to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, it's, the scripture talks about things of, of uh, us passing through the day of judgment without the smell of smoke upon us. Well, that's not going to be enough to get us into the most holy place. What we don't have is good, but it's not enough. We have to, it was, it's by the things that we have which makes us acceptable to God. Amen. And the gospel announces that he that hath the Son hath the life. Amen. He that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. Amen. See, but in, 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 in the provisions of God through the gospel, we have put on Christ. And, and the apostle says, you're accepted. You're now, you're accepted of God in the beloved. We have the smell of the sun, if you will, upon us. The people of God have that smell upon on us, that sweet-smelling savor unto God. And as they draw near unto God, our Heavenly Father likewise is blessing them. And he blesses them like no one other can bless. He blesses us with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and the sum of which is eternal life. And it's because the smell of the sun is upon us. The gospel again is revealing that the, sa the, sa the saints now in Christ Jesus are partakers of his promise. Emphasizing again that it's in Christ and in no other way, which reveals the necessity of our remaining and our continuing to abide in Christ. Amen. And we do by faith in him, by believing all that the scriptures reveal about himself and his accomplishments and his continuing work. Jesus, our great teacher, made these things known many times during his ministrations in the days of his flesh. One time Jesus said to his disciples, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Yeah. See, Jesus is both. The one by whom believers are raised from the dead to walk in newness of life. And Jesus himself is also the means by which we continue to live. Yeah. Jesus said, I am this provision unto life. But he wasn't done. There's more. There's more he wanted to tell you about. More he wanted to encourage you with. More things he wanted to, to good things to tell you about concerning himself. His, his preaching of the good news wasn't done yet in this text of, of John 11. There's an and here. Jesus reveals there's an and to what he first said. This is not the end of the matter of partaking of eternal life. It's just being raised from the dead. He talks about our continuing in Christ Jesus as being absolutely necessary unto our partakement of the fullness of that eternal life. He goes on to say, and whosoever liveth, these ones that were raised from the dead of their, and being in trespasses and sin, by being joined to the death of Christ, have a promise of the fullness of eternal life still yet to come if they continue to believe in Jesus if they continue to abide in Christ, if they continue to have their, his words abiding in them. He says, whosoever now liveth and believeth or continues to believe in me shall never die. See, these are the ones that have been raised up from the dead here now by the, by the power of God. There's a promise that these ones are not gonna be hurt by the second death that second death which is everlasting and eternal. The, one that, the second death that pertains to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to judge the living and the dead. And there's another account that Jesus said unto his disciples to this end. In John 6, picking up in verse 47, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me 
hath everlasting life. The, the, the manner of, of Jesus' speaking in these tenses is very vital. Believeth. He didn't say he, that you once believed. He that believeth continues. That's in this stance of continuing to believe on me. He says, you have it. You have it already. You have this eternal life. You're believing you have it. You have this eternal life. It's absolutely necessary. Jesus, Jesus is the one that's letting us know this. He says, I'm the, I am that bread of life. Compares it now with the, with the manna that fell in the wilderness. Your fathers that ate of that bread, they, they all died. But this, speaking of himself, is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that if a man eat thereof, he's not going to die. Jesus, to make it clear now, he says, I am that living bread which came down from heaven. If any man, there's that good news again, any man, any man, whosoever will, any man, if any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. When Jesus speaks, there's, there's no e exclusions. You, can't, you, can, you, you gotta find yourself somewhere in there, it's for the life of the world. Well, we're in the world. Any man, any person, any living being, say I gave it for you. He's emphasizing here this matter of continuing in him. It's vital to laying hold on eternal life. And the gospel is clearly declaring the saints' continual need of Jesus himself to partake of all those things that he has provided for us in his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. The saints need all of Jesus in order to partake of eternal life. And this Ephesians text that the apostle has penned for us reveals the God-ordained manner by which we do partake of the promise of eternal life, and that is by the gospel. Our continued hearing it, our continued hearkening unto it, our continued believing it, and our continued walking in its truth. The Apostle John <clears throat> spoke a lot about eternal life. This is something that he, he partook of his time with the, with the, with the Master, and he, he, would, he was one that would encourage the saints about this matter of eternal life. He, uh, he, had a, he wrote a letter in, in his first epistle that spoke a lot about eternal life, and he wanted to exhort, exhort the saints into partaking of this. But this, this exhortation was, wasn't only for those in that generation. It was for all generations of those that are in Christ Jesus. He was, he, was, he was an enabler of the people of God. He would, he would strengthen their faith he would, to, that, that in order that they would continually partake of the provision made by the gospel unto the obtainment of the fullness of eternal life. So his exhortation is made both to the church then and now. And it is most relevant as long as the church stands in this earth. In 1 John 5.13, the apostle declares, these things I have written unto you that you, he's written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Here, he's writing to the church. He's writing to those that are in Christ Jesus. I'm writing to you that do believe in the name of the Son of God with the divine objective in mind, one that the apostle was in full compartment with. He wanted, he wanted them to, to know these things. He said, I, I, I'm writing these things unto you that believe that you might know that ye have eternal life. And, he, there's another and, he says that you might believe or that you might continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen. See, the, the, the good news of the gospel is and then sounded forth, first and foremost by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the apostles are affirming all those things that Jesus said. And there's more good news. And I'll finish with this. That the saints are partaking. That's the announcement. That you are partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's, that's the word. That's the word. And he, he goes even further. He's going he's gonna to confirm that truth, if you will. He's going to give you evidences to you for you to, to examine yourself, to see that, yes, I am a partaker of eternal life. 
Things like this the apostles bring forth. It says this in 1 John 2, 5. Whoso keepeth his word. Here's that whoso again. Whosoever. You're keeping his word. He wants, he wants you to know something about those who are keeping his word. To all those that are holding it fast, believing it, and trusting it. In him, verily, is the love of God perfected. By this, hereby know we that we are in him. How do you know that you are in Christ Jesus? You're keeping his word. It's an evidence that you have eternal life. The gospel's making known this good news. If you're keeping his word, that is the evidence the gospel declares that you are in Christ who is that eternal life. Do you love the brethren? The gospel declares to all those who have loved, who do love the brethren, they've passed from death unto life. 1 John 3, 14. Are you engaged in a good fight of faith? The gospel tells you that you're laying hold on eternal life. We want to reckon, we want to reckon on these things that were revealed to the apostles of, of Jesus Christ. See? You are fighting. We know, you, you, we can encourage one another. Are you fighting? Brother, you're laying hold on eternal life. Yeah. Amen. There are evidences, see? There are evidences in the gospel of these things that God is doing. God doesn't do nothing in secret. He's manifesting that work which he's doing. And that work of giving eternal life, see, is being made manifest by the church, by all those that are continuing to believe in him. And so finally, I say to you, my brethren, Keep yourselves in the love of God. There is divine empowerment to stay where God has put us. And that's in Christ Jesus. So be sober. Be vigilant. Defend your ground. Abide in Christ. Let his word abide in you. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep yourself in Christ Jesus, partaking of the provisions of the gospel. Take hold of its revelations of good things to come and look for it with eager expectancy and anticipation. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel reveals that this looking will enable you to keep yourself in the love of God. And when Jesus comes again, his reward will be with him, even unto eternal life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.